Well, ladies and gentlemen, members, welcome to the first of our um, election uh, discussions, uh, at which we intend to look at uh, defence and foreign policy. Uh, we have uh, uh, spokespeople from the three major parties here for the next couple of weeks. Uh, we have today uh, Mr. Fallon, uh, next week we have Vernon Coker, and then after that uh, Lord Wallace representing the Liberal Democrats. Um, but for now, for this uh, straight one-hour session, this is all on the record, the speech is on the record, and the, and the question and answer is uh, all on the record. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Mr. Michael Fallon, who, of course, is Secretary of State for Defence. As Parliament is now dissolved, we don't have MPs anymore, but I can say he is the candidate for Seven Oaks. Um, and he has uh, had a ministerial career in the 1990s. He was in uh, the Department of Education and Science. He's been Deputy Chair of the Conservative Party. He's been a minister in, for uh, business and enterprise and also a minister for energy. And last year, on the 15th of July, he became uh, Secretary of State for Defence. So we're delighted that he is uh, able to kick off our coverage of the main party's positions on defence and security uh, with a speech here today, followed by Q&A. Mr Fallon, over to you, sir. Well, good morning, Michael, and thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today to set out conservative defence policy. Defence of the realm is the first duty of government. In 26 days' time, people will be casting their votes at a time when we are seeing multiple concurrent challenges to the international order, which many believe is unprecedented. In Eastern Europe, we have Russia subversing democracy, seeking to change international borders by force and destabilizing a sovereign state. In the Middle East, ISIL is spreading a new form of fascism in its warped drive to create a caliphate, bringing terror to the shores of the Mediterranean in Libya too. We're now seeing conflict in Yemen, which threatens our and other Western interests in the Gulf. And in Africa, we have Boko Haram causing chaos in northern Nigeria and along its border. Britain is better placed to respond to these threats that we face because over the past five years, Conservative Defence Secretaries have acted to ensure that our armed forces have the support they need to keep Britain safe. That meant taking some difficult decisions back in 2010 to deal with the £38 billion black hole in the defence budget that we inherited from Labour. We had to scrap some much-loved capabilities, the Harriers, HMS Ark Royal. We had to cancel some out-of-control procurement programmes like Nimrod. We've done that. We've sorted out the rebasing of our troops bringing troops back from Western Germany. We've made some painful choices about the size of our armed forces, but we've done so in a way that has protected our frontline clout. And we've also undertaken a major program to reform the Ministry of Defence to ensure that, unlike the chaos we inherited, the equipment we need <coughs> is delivered on time and on budget. Our reforms are now cutting the costs and the delays of defence projects. The cost of the 11 biggest project fell by £400 million in 2014. And we're becoming more efficient so that we can better support the front line and our more agile future force. Our reforms are on track to deliver the £4.3 billion of efficiencies agreed in the 2010 spending review, as well as the further 1.1 billion agreed in the 2013 spending review. That is over five billion pounds worth of efficiencies that were never identified, let alone achieved, under the previous Labour government. As a result of all these reforms, we have now successfully balanced the defence budget. And the MOD is trusted again, with the Treasury granting us the largest delegated budget of any Whitehall department. 
It is only with a strong economy that you can have strong defence. We do now have a properly funded, balanced £34 billion a year defence budget. The biggest in the European Union, the second biggest in NATO. We need that budget to keep Britain safe and to play our part in enforcing the rules-based system by which sovereign states live together. So let me set out for you now conservative defence policy. First, we will keep Britain safe. Our brave armed forces are working 24-7 across the world to protect us. Last year, some 90,000 troops were deployed to over 50 countries. In Iraq, we are making the second largest contribution to airstrikes against ISIL after the United States, and we are providing critical surveillance, command and control, and refueling. We are also training and equipping Iraqi forces. We have 145 troops inside Iraq this week training on heavy machine guns, infantry, and counter IED. In the Ukraine, British personnel are now delivering training in medical, logistics, infantry, and intelligence capacity building. We're also increasing our provision of non-lethal equipment to the Ukrainian armed forces. At the same time, we are helping to reassure our NATO allies by recommitting to the Baltic Air Policing Mission next month and significantly increasing our exercise program in Eastern Europe to remind President Putin of our commitment to Article 5. And as well as all that, we were still able to dispatch a ship, helicopters and 700 personnel with just 10 days' notice down to Sierra Leone to combat Ebola, helping to cut new cases of the disease from 700 new cases a week last autumn to fewer than 10 this week. And our armed forces also have been keeping us safe here at home, whether the quick reaction alert crews ready to defend our skies, the Royal Navy protecting our home waters, or the military guarding the Olympics and backing up the police on counter-terrorism. So we keep Britain safe. Second, Conservatives will ensure that Britain remains at the forefront of efforts to overcome threats to the international rules-based order on which our security and prosperity depend. Some thought that Labour's vote against limited action against Assad's regime in Syria in 2013 might mark the end of Britain playing that kind of role. I'm relieved that that has proved not to be the case. But continuing to play our part internationally means that we must be readier than ever to respond to multiple crises simultaneously. So we will deliver our reforms to create a more agile and deployable future force, drawing on regulars and reserves to deter and, if necessary, to engage aggressors. We're investing nearly two billion pounds in our reserve forces and recruitment is now back on track. The Army Reserve train strength has gone up over the last 12 months to 20,480, above our target for the year end. Overall, we are on track to deliver a train strength, reserve strength for all three armed forces of 35,000 by 2020. Our plans, therefore, mean that we will remain one of the very few countries in the world able to deploy a division-sized force when required. And the Prime Minister has very recently made clear again that there will be no further cuts to our regular armed forces. In contrast, the Labour Party have said that they would not take Army 2020 forward in its current form, scrapping the plan that was designed by the current Chief of the General Staff would throw our forces into chaos at a particularly dangerous time. And our commitment 
to defending that international order is unstinting. That's why we're pressing hard to strengthen NATO, the bedrock of our defense. At last September's summit in Newport, it was the United Kingdom and the United States that persuaded all alliance members to increase their spending on defense and to respond more rapidly to unfolding crises. Since then, <clears throat> we've become one of the first nations to support NATO's new Very High Readiness Joint Task Force. We've committed to lead that force in 2017, and so far we are the only country to commit to all eight new headquarters and force integration units in Eastern Europe. Third, a Conservative government will make sure that our armed forces have the capabilities that they need. Over the next 10 years, we're committed to spending £163 billion pounds on equipment and equipment support. That includes new Joint Strike fighters, more surveillance aircraft, seven hunter-killer submarines, two new aircraft carriers, and nearly 600 of the most advanced armoured vehicles. The future, <coughs> the future of our nuclear deterrent has become one of the big questions at this election. For 45 years, Britain has kept a ballistic missile submarine at sea, providing the ultimate guarantee of security against nuclear attack or nuclear blackmail 24-7, 365 days a year. And in a world where there are approximately 17,000 nuclear weapons, we cannot gamble with the security that our deterrent provides. We know that there are substantial nuclear arsenals and that the number of nuclear states is increasing. Russia is modernizing its nuclear forces and is actively commissioning a new class of eight ballistic missile submarines. North Korea has conducted three nuclear tests and other ballistic missile tests <coughs> in defiance of the international community. <coughs> often, other often unstable states want nuclear weapons and are seeking the technology to develop them. We cannot know now what nuclear threats may emerge in the 2030s, the 2040s, and the 2050s. So the only responsible choice is to recommit to our continuous at sea deterrent now so that we can cope with any direct nuclear threat to the United Kingdom or to our NATO allies. That is why I have announced that the Conservative Manifesto to be published next week will guarantee that we will build a new fleet of four successor ballistic missile submarines replacing the four Vanguard boats. We will retain the Trident continuous at sea nuclear deterrent to provide the ultimate guarantee of our security. There is no alternative to continuous patrols that provides the same level of protection and deterrence. Two years ago, the official government review concluded that there is no alternative as capable or as cost-effective as a submarine-based deterrent. Now, while some parties have proposed three boats, all earlier studies have shown that four submarines are required to maintain this continuous posture. The cost of these successor submarines is estimated to be some 25 billion pounds at outturn prices. Those costs will be spread over 25 years. Indeed, if the costs were spread even, they would represent an, it would represent an annual insurance <coughs> premium of some 0.13% on all government spending. Yesterday, as you may have seen, I raised the dangers that a Labour Party propped up by the Scottish National Party would pose to the renewal of our deterrent. The only way that Ed Miliband can get into Downing Street is with the support 
of Nicola Sturgeon. And earlier this week, she said, and I quote, we had better believe that Trident is a red line, unquote. Amongst the bluster yesterday in response, a central issue facing voters in four years' time, in four weeks' time, remains. Can you trust Ed Miliband not to put the nuclear deterrent on the bargaining table in some backroom deal with the SNP? We still have no certain answer. So the next government, the next Conservative government, must plan ahead and renew that deterrent so that we can always keep one of our boats continuously at sea. And we are the only party to make that pledge unequivocally. Some of the other parties' positions are frankly absurd. The Liberal Democrats, for example, want to spend billions to, and I quote, replace some of the submarines and make our deterrent part-time. They have now committed to some submarines going to sea with unarmed missiles. Pointless patrols, a pointless policy proposed by an increasingly pointless party. Put simply, it is only the Conservatives that will not gamble with the security of the British people. Finally, a Conservative government will always back the armed forces community, our troops, their families, and our veterans. We have enshrined the principles of the military covenant in law so that never again can our servicemen and women find that the covenant is not honoured where they live. Over the past five years, we have supported our personnel and their families with over a billion pounds invested in better accommodation. And our 200 million pound forces help to buy scheme has helped thousands of personnel move into their own home. Some 3,000 already completed, some 1,500 approved and waiting for their purchase itself to complete. We're using now some 200 million pounds of LIBOR fines to improve accommodation to improve childcare and to support military charities. Injured soldiers now have access to better treatment and the latest prosthetics, and some 300 million pounds will be invested in a new world-class rehabilitation facility at Stamford Hall. Supporting our troops also means protecting them from legal claims that seek to override established international humanitarian law with human rights laws. The cumulative effect of Strasbourg's decisions on the freedom to conduct military operations raises serious challenges, which were highlighted again by some former chiefs, the former chiefs of defense staff, just last week. Over the last few years, we've seen the lodging of legal claims on an industrial scale, many of these for events that happened years ago. I have instructed the Ministry to contest robustly such claims, but I have to tell you that they are costing taxpayers millions of pounds and they are undermining the morale and effectiveness of our armed forces. So I can announce today that the next Conservative government will ensure that our armed forces serving overseas are not subject to persistent human rights claims that will, could undermine their ability to do their job. This is not about putting our armed forces above the law. The law of armed conflict based on the Geneva Conventions will still apply, and our troops who are injured will still get the, comp the compensation that they deserve. But this will stop spurious claims and the worst forms of ambulance chasing that we've seen. Top uh, of uh, the intray for the new Defence Secretary after the election will be the Strategic Defence and Security Review and the Spending Review alongside it. And I want to turn finally to those two. I have been overseeing some 
preliminary work to assess what has changed in the international security environment and how the risks to that have evolved. We have also been examining lessons from past operations and assessing what operations we might have to conduct during the next decade, where, when, with and against who. That work will inform the national security strategy and the next strategic defense and security review and the decisions around the capability gaps that exist at the moment. As Defense Secretary, I have also been instilling the need for the Ministry of Defense as an organization that spends 34 billion pounds a year to be permanently fit and efficient, not simply to get fit for spending reviews. In this parliament just ended, we have shown that major savings can be made through new approaches by selling the Defense Support Group, which maintains the Army's vehicles. We got £140 million for taxpayers, but we will also generate £500 million of savings over a 10-year contract. We brought in a strategic partner to get to grips with a sprawling defense property estate, which will save us £3 billion over the next 10 years. And we will continue that over the next parliament. Where my party differs from Labour is that while we, while we will find more efficiencies, we are committed to spending £34 billion this year on defense. Their zero-based review means that they cannot currently commit to any of our spending programs. In conclusion, let me set out again our commitment to a strong defense. We have met and will this year meet again the 2% NATO target. Decisions for spending beyond 15, 16 are, as you know, for the autumn spending review. But we make three stronger, more specific commitments. A new triple lock that guarantees the size, the shape, and the power of our armed forces beyond the spending review, right through to the end of the next parliament. First, we commit to increasing the defense equipment budget by at least 1% more than inflation throughout the Parliament. That will enable us to invest in our two new aircraft carriers, the biggest ships the Royal Navy has ever seen, in seven hunter-killer nuclear submarines, in 600 new armored vehicles for the Army, in new joint strike fighters for the carrier. Second, we commit to making no further reductions in the size of our regular armed forces. And third, we commit to modernizing our independent nuclear deterrent, replacing the four existing Vanguard submarines with new submarines that will serve from the late 2020s right through to 2060. Three specific long-term commitments unmatched by any other party. The two NATO targets are important especially for those countries that have yet to meet even 1%. But it's important also to make and keep specific commitments that give our armed forces what they need. I am confident that the public will look over, back over the last five years and judge that it is only the Conservative Party and our long-term economic plan that will make sure our armed forces have the resources they need to defend our interests and values across the world for the next five years and beyond. Thank you. Do you want me to sit down? Or stay here. Stay here. Mr. Fallon, thank you very much indeed. That was a very clear set of statements and a very interesting uh, summary of the triple lock that you uh, describe toward the end of your speech. Um, we have uh, just on 30 minutes for questions. We are still uh, on the, we stay on the record for questions. Um, so uh, let's uh, range as far as we would like to. Gentleman over there first, sir. 
You will need a microphone because the acoustics in here. Cool. Uh, will Inglis from Forces TV. Um, Defence Secretary, um, what guarantees can you give that another Conservative-led defence review won't be a mere fig leaf for more cuts with the forces still reeling from the cuts uh, introduced last time? Well, the, uh, cut, the cuts that uh, were necessary last time have completed. The last redundancies have taken place. They are now behind us. The absolute guarantee you have, as I set out this morning, that there will be no further cuts to the size of our regular armed forces, and you will have an equipment budget that will increase ahead of inflation throughout the next parliament. We are giving the armed forces not simply that commitment that there will be no further cuts, but a very firm pledge of additional spending to come. When you say size, Mr Fallon, of our regular armed forces, do you mean manpower? Is yes. that what size means? Yes. Yeah. Size, okay. size, yeah. yeah. Okay, fine, thank you. Numbers. Sir, <clears throat> at the back. Thank you very much, Chris Shipp from uh, ITV News. Um, given the fallout from what you said yesterday, have you slept on your words overnight and woken up this morning and regretted saying what you did say about Ed Miliband yesterday? I'm sure you'll repeat that the accusation about Trident and the SNP and all the rest of it, but I'm asking you specifically about the personal attack you made on him yesterday. Do you regret it now? Absolutely not. This is the, the rough and this is a general election that's taking place here. This is the rough and tumble of, uh, of politics, and uh, the public need to know who is going to lead their country and what he is likely to do to get into power in Downing Street. That's a perfectly legitimate question. I care passionately about the defence of this country and the future of our deterrent, and I posed a question yesterday that has still not been wholly answered. What are the terms? under which Labour would share power with the SNP when you have the SNP now say that scrapping the deterrent is an absolute red line. OK, um, we'll take uh, John Wilson and then Deborah Haynes in the front row. John Wilson first. John Wilson, a member of the Institute and a journalist. Uh, Minister, I thought you've made an excellent case for retaining Trident. In view of Nicola Sturgeon's policy to get rid of Trident, and the policy uh, and possibility that she could coerce a future minority Labour government, would the Conservatives put country before party and vote in support of a Labour government on defence, including a vote of confidence? Uh, well, we're not expecting a Labour government. We're, 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 we're planning on a majority Conservative government on the 7th of May, so that question doesn't arise... Uh, directly, but I made it very clear today the importance we attach to the deterrent and our very real concern that um, because of the rise of the Scottish National Party, that voters elsewhere in the United Kingdom, as well as voters in Scotland, that voters in England, Wales and Northern Ireland could have their defence put in jeopardy by some uh, backroom deal between Labour and the Scottish National Party. Mm. Thank you. Deborah. Um, are you worried that some um, long-term Conservative supporters who've been lobbying hard for this 2% NATO commitment to be actually in, clearly, cl clearly stated in the manifesto will now defect to UKIP, given that they've sort of clearly stated that 2%? And can I just ask on the Falklands, um, after we've heard that the Argentinian government, Argentine government sorry, um, is going to be, um, or has launched legal action against these three British energy firms and you know, called our ambassador and sort of voiced concerns about the comments that you made about you know, the need to sort of boost up our defences there. Are you worried that this is going to escalate further? What, what response do you have to that, please? Well, on the first, uh, UKIP may have pledged 2%, but they have pledged an awful lot of things without actually setting out a budget. And you need to ask UKIP how they would raise the various amounts of money they've been uh, pledging recently for all sorts of uh, causes. We've made our position clear on the 2% uh, uh, for a long time now, and it's not changed, that uh, we are meeting the 2%. We met it at the time of the target. We're meeting it in the financial year that's just begun. And we have the spending review coming in September. And I've set out today uh, three stronger and more specific commitments that actually take us right through the spending review out the other side to the end of the uh, next parliament. So there should be no doubt about our uh, financial commitment uh, to defence. So far as the Falklands is uh, concerned, I... Uh, uh, set out the conclusions of our uh, uh, 
uh, Falklands Defence Review, which was established under my predecessor. I have committed £180 million to be spent over the next 10 years in strengthening our defence of the Falklands, including replacement of the rapier missiles there and uh, other investment in infrastructure. And I made it very clear in the House of Commons that uh, we continue to resist uh, our Argentinian uh, claims uh, to sovereignty over the islands, and that includes the natural resources that surround them. Mm. Thank you. Sir, you and Grant. Um, thank you very much, Secretary of State. Um, you and Grant, Rusi member, uh, much of my post civil service career has been in the ex Soviet states and not Russia. Question is um, how concerned should the, uh, the next British government, this audience, and some of our European and US partners about the fact that during recent speeches at Chatham House, um, the outgoing European Commission President, and more recently, a few weeks ago, the new EC Foreign Affairs Commissioner, in their prepared speeches on international security, never mentioned NATO once. Um, well, I wasn't uh, aware of that. And, uh, thank you for uh, informing us of that. Um, what I think is, is important, going, certainly going forward, is that uh, we improve the relationship between the European Union and NATO. It is a point I've discussed with uh, Federica Mogherini, the incoming uh, High Representative who, who was at the Ministry uh, a few weeks ago. It's a point I've emphasized to her that we need to avoid uh, overlap, particularly on some of the, uh, the programs and the way in which uh, the European Defence Agent, the ambition of the European Defence uh, Agency, and so on. Um, and I, I hope, too, that the European Union would recognize in its other work, particularly in the need to complete a single market in energy and speed up two-way flows of gas, to do what it can to reduce the dependence of some of those Eastern European states that you, Central European states, the former Soviet states that you referred to, to help reduce their dependence on Russia and their exposure to uh, to Russia in the form of uh, gas supplies and other economic ties. So there is plenty for the European Union to be getting on with to help to uh, consolidate the European market and make it easier for those countries to uh, get uh, cheaper energy supplies and to develop their trading links. But uh, the defence is, is clearly a matter that should be left to NATO. Mm, thank you. Uh, Professor Jonathan Isle. Um, Jonathan Isle from here, from the Institute. Uh, the Secretary of State, could you? Uh, you mentioned that we will keep reminding Mr. Putin of our commitment to NATO's Article 5. Now, apart from the broad posture of UK's armed forces, uh, are you content that uh, Article 5 remains as robust as ever? Would it not require more permanent uh, deployment of troops or equipment uh, in the new member states of the alliance in order to make it very clear to Mr. Putin that Article 5 is the proverbial red line? Well, Article 5 itself uh, is clear enough, but it is important that we get member states, particularly um, member states that may have somewhat forgotten the threat from uh, Russia, that we get member states to focus on what Article 5 commits us all to do. And that was the significance of the agreement last September on the Very High Readiness Joint Task Force. And what's important now as we move to the June uh, NATO ministerial meeting is that other countries commit, commit to the uh, secondment of, of troops to the bases in the same way that we do. We are committing to both headquarters, the headquarters in Stettin and the headquarters in, uh, in Bucharest, as well as to the six forward integration units. What's important is we all commit to making a reality of that force. We agree on the enablers that go alongside the leading framework nation in each uh, particular year and that we strengthen NATO's ability to counter in terms of strategic communications the propaganda claims that are coming out uh, of Russia. And we continue our, to develop our exercises. We've made it uh, very plain. We want to see more exercises in Eastern and Central Europe. We want to see more continuous 
larger scale exercises. We want to see more of them conducted under the NATO umbrella, just to make it, just to make it absolutely clear in terms of reassurance to those uh, states that we are committed. That's something I discussed, uh, uh, for example, with my opposite number in, uh, in Bucharest uh, just uh, a couple of weeks ago. Mm. Okay, uh, Professor Chalmers, and as a gentleman, I can't quite see around the... Okay, right, Malcolm first. Uh, okay. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, Malcolm Chalmers from the Institute. Um, one of the most distinctive features of the Conservative platform in this election is the commitment to holding a referendum on our membership of the European Union during this parliament. Uh, and you didn't mention this in, in your remarks, so I wanted you to, if, uh, if you, you could, uh, to, to explain to us whether there are defence implications for this. First of all, whether you envisage any defence issues uh, being involved in the negotiation that precedes the referendum. And second of all, do you think that uh, a UK that left the European Union as a result of such a referendum would find its relationships with other NATO members impaired in any way? Well, uh, taking the second question first, the answer, the answer has to be no, because there are members um, uh, of NATO who are not members of the European Union. And uh, these are organisations that have uh, very different functions. And as I said earlier, what we continue to seek to do is to avoid overlap uh, between them. There have been some successful European Union missions, um, but it is important to maintain the distinction and to avoid any kind of mission creep on the side of the, on the part of the European Union into areas that are properly the realm of defence and of NATO. Um, I can't envisage any particular defence uh, issues that might come up in the renegotiation and the reforms that we seek beyond the repatriation of uh, some justice and security powers that we feel should never have been handed over to Brussels in the, firm, in the first place, where indeed there may be uh, some support amongst other member states for getting them back to uh, national governments and to national parliaments. Uh, but beyond that, no. Sir. John Stevens from the Daily Mail. Um, as has been mentioned, UKIP has committed to spending 2% on defence. Do you think this will make it easier for you, the Tories, to work with them after the election? Well, we're not planning to work with uh, UKIP after the election. We don't work with them at the moment. And we're not planning on working with anybody after the election. We're planning on a majority conservative uh, government. They've made all sorts of pledges, uh, money for the health service, money for this, money for that. What they've not done is produced a budget. They've not shown how they would actually uh, afford the 2% target and how they would uh, be able to cost it alongside their uh, other commitments. So. It's, uh, and I don't think you can be taken seriously unless you do set out your spending commitments and your taxation commitments to show exactly how you would do it. Mm. So, gentleman down here. Sorry, you know, is a gentleman just in this row, and then we'll come to the front. There's a microphone on its way on your left hand side, sir. Hello. Um, Tim Ferrity, member of the Institute. You described in rather depressing uh, tones the need uh, to retract what the armed forces could do, compare what we were able to do in 1991, compared with what we can do now, and it's all rather depressing. Money is, is certainly uh, the, the, the root problem. Why not join the International Development Fund with the armed forces? After all, there's a big overlinking between the two. You highlighted one this morning, the operations Sierra Leone and Ebola. Uh, th that would give uh, several more billion to the armed forces that it desperately needs. And it seems to me a wrong-handed way of going about it that we, the attitude we've taken towards the uh, Independent de uh, Development uh, Fund and putting it into law and the retraction of money funding the armed forces. Well, you're right in that these um, two uh, budgets um, should be seen as side by side. They are both... In many, many countries of the world, they're both about security, they're both about conflict prevention and stabilization as much as, uh, actual, as actual fighting. And of course, the work that's being done in Sierra Leone is uh, largely funded out of the uh, overseas uh, budget. But there are strict rules about how spending is classified uh, for the purposes of the 0.7% uh, target. And there are indeed rules, there are NATO rules on how uh, NATO expenditure is classified. So 
although it sounds, um, it sounds rather attractive to uh, combine them together, I don't think under international accounting rules for either organ, for in either respect that uh, one could do so. But we work more and more closely with the Department of International Development, and uh, I don't see these two expenditure lines as opposites, like you. They are two sides of the same, of the same coin. And money spent on overseas development can indeed uh, save uh, military expenditure and military action later on. Malcolm Savage, former MP. Uh, uh, first of all, um, you, you may be aware of the comments of General Lord Dannett and various other former senior members of the Defence Forces that they do not believe that nuclear weapons, they believe that nuclear weapons are far too serious an issue to be used for electoral ploys. And I wonder if you'd like to respond to that. But I'd also like to ask, um, since we rely on collective defence through NATO, is there a serious uh, defence reason why we need to have three separate countries all having continuous at sea deterrence rather than having collective continuous at sea deterrence through NATO? Well, on the, on the second point, we've always had an independent uh, deterrent here, and it is an issue that goes right to the heart of national sovereignty. And I, I think you'd take a lot of persuading of the British people to uh, abandon uh, overall control of their deterrent to. Uh, uh, the other two countries that you mentioned. On the first question of whether it's right to mention Trident in this election, let us just be very clear. The decision on renewing Trident is for this parliament that you are about to elect. The main gate, as it's called in the jargon, the final investment decision on the timing and the cost of the four new submarines is a matter for your members of parliament. It's a decision that has to be taken next year in 2016. So it is, is and should be right at the front of this general election as to whether or not the candidates in your constituency are prepared to support the renewal of our nuclear deterrent. I hope you will go and ask them. Okay. Uh, Peter Roberts. Uh, Peter Roberts from the Institute. Um, it's possible to look at the far, last five years and the cuts that have um, uh, been put into a uh, British defence community as a series of shifting to dependencies on others, whether it's the US for ballistic missile defense shield against uh, rogue states, the French to provide maritime patrol aircraft uh, in the UK waters, uh, for the Chinese Navy to evacuate British nationals uh, from places abroad, such as Yemen, which they did a couple of days ago, the US Coast Guard to man naval warships, the Italians to defend the southern flank, ISIS, uh, sorry, Iran to fight ISIS, small nations within NATO to provide the niche capabilities over EW and cyber, uh, this looks like a, almost a deliberate strategy of, uh, of offsetting, um, or is it by accident? Well, I think what you're touching on is more growing into dependence, particularly amongst the alliance. There are lessons we've learned in that from Afghanistan, and we play our part in that. We have, uh, uh, we have a ship in the Gulf at the moment that's part of the American carrier screen. You didn't mention that we were lifting French troops into Mali because they didn't have the, the airlift concern. Um, so there, has, there is more interdependence in terms of capabilities. In terms of rescuing civilians, we rescue other people's civilians if the Royal Navy is at hand, and uh, we look to our allies to help us uh, where necessary. There is a growing independence amongst allies in the way we use and deploy assets, and I don't think we should, uh, um, you know, I don't think we should be uh, uh, bothered about that at all. Uh, on the contrary, I think we should see more interdependence, more joint working together in carrier groups and so on, and I would expect other countries to, uh, uh, to be uh, flying off our carriers and be part of our carrier groups just in the same way that we have our pilots on American carriers and we provide ships as part of the screen for American carriers. I don't see, any, I don't see anything wrong with that. Do you? Okay, there's a gentleman here and then a lady a couple of rows behind. Sir. Thank you, Ahmed Shikara from the Institute, a new member. Uh, right, Honorable, uh, do you think that uh, 145 uh, trainer, uh, trainers, uh, in, uh, British trainers to Iraq is sufficient number uh, at this time, at this uh, critical time? And do you think NATO strategy should be enlarged so that it will uh, have a vision for all the what happens in the Middle East, whether in Syria and Iraq as well, because the IS is basically, if you don't defeat it in Syria, you cannot defeat it in Iraq. And do you think, when, uh, do you, think you have any strategy which is comprehensive uh, to the Middle East? Thank you. 
Well, on the first point, everything that we and the other coalition partners are doing in Iraq is at the invitation of the legitimate Iraqi government, the Abadi government in Iraq. It is at their invitation and it is with their authority. And they do not want foreign troops on the ground in Iraq. They've made that very clear. Even if NATO, some NATO country wanted to be involved there, that is not what the uh, Iraqi government wants. And they're right. This is a, a, a battle that has to be won in the end with our support from the air and our support in training and our support in equipment and intelligence. In the end, this is a battle that can only be won by uh, local ground forces, by a home army that has the support of the local population that properly reflects all the different divisions in Iraqi society. Otherwise, we're going to go back to the bad old days of, uh, of Maliki uh, and the others. On your second point, uh, you're right. Uh, ISIS, in the end, has to be defeated in both Syria and in Iraq. Um, we've been uh, clear about that. We have a parliamentary authority to operate in Iraq. There is not, we judge at the moment, a consensus uh, to give us that authority to operate uh, in, uh, in Syria. But we have plenty to do to help in Iraq, as I said. We've uh, conducted uh, over 200 uh, airstrikes in Iraq. We're playing the second part to the United States, far bigger than any other NATO country. And we are playing a crucial role there in, in supplying intelligence and increasingly in stepping up our training effort, as I said. Low hundreds, 145 troops there this week. Uh, lady in the middle. Thank um. you. Uh, Sarah Ingham, Institute member. Um, acknowledging your previous point about interdependence, do you think that the senior commanders in the United States military, personnel in the Department of Defense, and indeed the U.S. taxpayer will be happy with conservative spending plans for defense? Thank you. Well, I've discussed our spending plans and our current position with the new Secretary of State, with Ash Carter, when I was in uh, Washington uh, a month or so ago, and uh, he made no complaint about the level of our uh, commitment. On the contrary, the President and others there have described the United Kingdom as their indispensable partner. They're the ones they look, we're the ones they look to when they turn around for assistance uh, around the globe, and I was able to set out for uh, Ash Carter, the sheer scale of our investment program now uh, in the aircraft carriers and submarines and uh, joint strike fighters and, uh, and the other uh, uh, projects that uh, I, I told you about this morning. I was able to set out the scale of the equipment program and to reassure him that the cuts that were necessary back in 2010 are over now. There aren't going to be any more uh, large-scale redundancies. But yes, there is genuine concern in Washington about the level of defense spending across the alliance. Uh, seven of the 28 don't even meet 1%. 20 of the 28 don't meet 1.5%. Um, you know, we are at the front of the class. Uh, there is an awful lot that other countries have to do to raise their level of spending, to get anywhere near the level of spending that the United States is committing to the alliance. Mm. Uh, gentleman there, sir. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, Yasuo Naito uh, from the Japan Sankey News. Uh, you today didn't mention about the China, uh, while the China is now building up the military in uh, Asian theater. Uh, could it be possible to hear uh, your view towards the China's military buildup? Thank you. I'm sorry it wasn't possible to uh, go into every particular uh, theatre, um, but we are certainly not neglecting the, the Pacific uh, theatre, although obviously we are returning to the Gulf and we're, under, uh, we're part of the coalition fight against ISIL, and that is occupying our attention, as is the uh, spread of Boko Haram across the borders of Nigeria, the threat to Chad and Niger, and the rise of ISIL along the Mediterranean. Literal, these are very pressing concerns, that should not, uh, that does not mean we are not concerned about uh, developments in the Pacific. I have recently visited uh, South Korea and the, the demilitarized zone there and uh, been for discussions in, uh, in Australia alongside the Foreign Secretary about what more needs to be done to help stabilize security in the Pacific regions. Um, we hope too to see here um, a, an improvement in relations 
amongst the amongst the, the main countries in relations between uh, Japan and Korea, and again between Japan and China and Korea and China and so on. Some of these bilateral relationships uh, do need to be strengthened, and we're ready to uh, play our part in that. We're ready to to engage with China uh, to uh, encourage uh, uh, continuing reform in North Korea and more stability on the Korean uh, Peninsula. And we are increasing our military uh, cooperation, our mill-mill activity with China to better understand their uh, naval and military ambitions. We had a recent visit by the Chief of Defence Staff last week following a visit from the, the First Sea Lord, and we are built, trying to build up a better understanding of uh, what it is the uh, Chinese build-up is, is, is designed to uh, achieve. Mm. Thank you. Elizabeth Quintana. Uh, Liz Quintana, um, uh, member of staff here at the Institute. Um, Secretary of State, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you about space and cyber. Um, cyber, we've seen an increase in investment um, over the last term. I wondered whether you um, see that increasing again going forwards and also uh, whether or not we might see a balance of investment decision between uh, cyber and more traditional forms of um, capability. Thank you. Yes, I think we will, is the short answer to that. I can't prejudge the Strategic Defence and Security Review, but in the uh, cyber had its place in the 2010 review, um, and um, uh, almost inevitably it's one of those areas that has grown in, uh, in, in terms of threat, and uh, it's certainly going to be a focus. Some of this work falls outside my own department. It's led, as you know, by the Cabinet Office and by, by other, uh, other departments, but yes, cyber will almost certainly be a a big feature of the of, of the next review. We need to look at how we can spread uh, good practice about cyber, particularly amongst our commercial organizations, companies that may not even know they are subject to cyber attacks. We need to strengthen the cyber resilience of our critical national assets, some of the infrastructure that we have that is uh, prone to cyber attack, particularly amongst uh, the supply chain and contractors involved in uh, maintaining that uh, infrastructure. And uh, we need to look across the board at uh, how we keep up to date with the latest cyber technology. So will cyber be a big part of it? Yes, it will. Mm. I'll give the last question to Ambassador Walker. Yeah. Uh, Rookie Walker, member of the Institute. Am I splitting a hair if I note, Secretary of State, that you made a commitment for the regular armed forces but didn't mention the word reserves? Are you leaving yourself leeway there? Um, no, with, with great respect, I did mention reserves. Uh, I, I mentioned the target of 35,000 by 2020. I outlined the progress we're making to that target, and that remains our target. Uh, we are still committed to the, to the whole force, uh, the 35,000 uh, the, the, the 30, for the Army on top of the um, uh, 82,000. Um, but I was giving the Prime Minister's very specific commitment, which I, I hope you expect to see repeated in the manifesto next week, that there will be no further cuts to the regular armed forces. On the contrary, reserves are being built up, and that program is now back on track. Thank you. We must uh, draw it to a close there. Um, you will uh, note, uh, Mr. Fallon, that uh, we may be in election mode here, but you are Secretary of State for Defence, and so in front of a Rusi audience, nobody would go, <laughs> nobody's going to waste the opportunity to ask some questions of the Secretary of State for Defence in that role. Um, but we're very pleased that you're able to start off our election coverage um, with that very clear set of statements and some very important statements, I think. I should um, repeat that uh, next Friday on the 17th uh, at 11 o'clock, Vernon Coker will speak for the Labour Party. On the 20th, Monday the 20th at 11 o'clock, Lord Wallace of Saltair will speak for the Liberal Democrats. And then on Friday the 24th of October at 1.30, 13.30, we have a round table uh, uh, conducted through the British Forces Broadcasting Service with Conservative, Labour, Liberal Democrat, UKIP and SNP representatives uh, on a, uh, exclusively on defence and security within the election. Um, this always restores my faith in British elections. I think we have a, a robust, refreshing set of exchanges. And when we go into election mode, you said, Mr. Fallon, it's part of the rough and tumble of elections. It is, but there's a sort of, there's a, sort of a, a straight honesty about elections where candidates 
put forward what they believe, what they stand for, and invite you to compare what they stand for with what other people stand for. I, I find that all of these discussions, when people say they're fed up with elections, I always, I always think, come to Rusi and listen to the way we talk about defence and security at elections. I think it would restore your faith in the British democratic process, and I think you've done that for us today. Right Honourable Michael Fallon, candidate uh, for Seven Oaks in Kent, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.